My name is Vlad Mihalcea. I work, I'm an independent consultant. Nowadays, I mostly uh, direct all my uh, working hours to delivering, uh, either uh, creating products like high persistence optimizer or, or writing books, mostly blogging on uh, this website that I have or creating open source projects and uh, using uh, Twitter compulsively. And, you know, when you're going to a conference, they are going to talk, most, most of the people are, uh, talk about the latest trends in technology, like, you know, blockchain, service meshes, reactive programming. I've seen a lot of talks about Kubernetes and the many things which are new. However, in this talk, we're not going to talk about that. Why? Because those things, don't get me wrong, those things are really, really interesting. But however, when you go back, when you go back to work, this is what you are going to find there. So basically, this is the, the stack, the, the most common technologies that uh, Stack Overflow, they, they just ran a survey and people just uh, uh, responded with what they are using uh, um, in their daily, on, on a daily basis on their work. So basically, if you take a look there, you'll see that we have the front-end technologies and the database, and then we're just moving data from the database to the browsers most of the time, no matter if we're using Java, PHP, C Sharp, or Python. This is basically what, uh, what we're uh, using most of the time. So now, SQL was on top three of these technologies. You can say that it's uh, an old-fashioned technology in a way because we've been having it for at least 50 years. It's between 50 and 40 years. Uh, if you take a look in history, this in almost 50 years ago, Cod, who was not pleased, he was working for IBM, he was not pleased with uh, IMS database systems at that time. I don't know, have you ever, any one of you worked with IMS or with IBM, with mainframes or stuff like that? Is there anyone? I can give you an example. I have a friend who's working for a company, and they are supporting a client in, uh, in the US using uh, COBOL. And they used to have a field that was like 16 characters, and they needed to make it 32 characters. They finished ahead of time. It took seven months to do that. So that was the kind of uh, work that Cod was not really pleased of. So he, won, he, he's, he, he was a math mathematician, so he envisioned a much better way of doing separating the algorithms, the data, data structures from the actual uh, language of expressing what you want to get from the database. So throughout the, so throughout the uh, 70s, people were prototyping, were interesting about that idea. So IBM. Uh, was building a prototype system R at the time. Also, Michael Stonebreaker, who won an Alan Turing Award and who's the creator of PostgreSQL, started uh, at Berkeley with some students. He started a prototype of code relational model, and it was called Ingress at the time. Also, Larry Ellison, who's the CEO of Oracle, who always had uh, uh, an insight about what actually can be, what, what, an, an insight about seeing the business value in things also realized that there's a very good potential in implementing a database system like that. So he created, with his company, they created Oracle. The first version was version 2. Why? Because he realized that people will not, never buy version 1. You are most likely to buy version 2 because it's a much more mature product. So this, this is the first version that it came in, in 1979. So if you think about it, this is a 40-year-old database still being used today. So in the 80s, that's when we got DB2. SQL Server, first it was Cybers SQL Server, it was just a fork of Cybers. Postgres SQL, Postgres first. Then in the 90s, from Postgres, we got Postgres SQL, MySQL, and SQL Server. So even the newest database, uh, we can track their history back to 20 years ago. So people question, well, why would I use SQL? Because it's old fashioned and it's quite, quite, an old, uh, qu quite an old language. However, it's, yeah, it's, it originated many, many years ago, but it has evolved throughout the time, so it's not really that old because it keeps on changing and it keeps on adapting, just like any other language. So, basically, if you take a look on the same survey, you can see that the top database systems used in productions, used on a daily basis by most of the developers, are just relational databases, MySQL, Postgres, then you have also MariaDB and Oracle. Now, without searching, without Google, do you really do you remember what SQL was supposed to mean? What's that uh, S in uh, SQL means? Whenever I have a question like that, you know, I could just go to Twitter. Uh, next, 
Okay, so yes, most of the people got it right, but people really associate SQL with the standard. Uh, and in fact, it is a standard because throughout, uh, throughout the years, uh, there was a consortium who realized that many databases uh, um, deviate from how um, SQL should be expressed, so it's better to standardize this and to have all of them converge to having a simple and unified way of querying the database. So yes, nowadays we have a standard. However, most of the people using their uh, application, they use a flavor of SQL 92. Why? Because when, whenever you have a problem and you don't know how to write a query, where do you go? To W3 schools, right? Who, who's ever, uh, who has used this uh, or record? Most of it? Yeah, I, I did the same. That's how I learned SQL. It was in 2004 when I learned SQL. The problem is this, it's the same. It hasn't changed. But you know, that was 2004. I mean, there are so many years have passed, and SQL has changed tremendously from 2004. Actually, this one might be even older than that. So this is what most of the people use. SQL 92 was not the first. Actually, it was the third versions of the standard. But it was, the, it was a major increment of the standard because it added many features like database types, check, case expressions, information schemas. We have plenty of things. So in a way, it was a breakthrough at that time. And actually, even with SQL 92, there are many features which not all the developers are aware of, but are very uh, interesting and you can st still do. And one example I can show you, this is a typical example, you can bump into it uh, many, many times. Whenever you have a one-to-many table relationship, like a post with a post comment, and what do we want now? We want to fetch some post, a number of posts, with all their associated comments, and we want to paginate them. Now, you cannot just do that using limit or something like that, because if you put a fixed limit, you might end up truncating the last comments of the last post. So you don't want to do that. You have to do it in a different way. So how most of the, uh, so, so if this is a, the example, we have a post, this one has three comments. Yes, I want that. And I also want to get a second with all its comments. I don't want to get anything uh, beyond. Maybe this one, maybe this table uh, has many rows, so I don't want to fetch uh, uh, everything from there. So, because w why I don't want to fetch? Because it doesn't fit on the screen. It, does, uh, it makes no sense to fetch 100,000 records because I, don't, I cannot display uh, that on my mobile phone or my desktop application. So one, one option to use, most, most developers using Java, uh, when, whenever they want to fetch data from the database, they either use JPA or Hibernate. So this is one option how you can use. You can just uh, select from the post, join fetching all the comments and using pagination, telling Hibernate that you're only interested in the first two posts but with all their associated comments. And when you execute it, it works. However, you will also get a warning telling you that the pagination was done in memory. So if there were 100,000 posts, you would, get, you would fetch from the database 100,000 posts with comments, and then you just discard everything but the first two that you wanted. So if you take a look at the SQL, there is actually no pagination. So yes, this works, but it's not very efficient. But you can actually fix it very, very easily, and it's just SQL 92 with a query like this one, with a subquery, with an in query, with the exist. There's, there are many things that you can do. So they are very simple to execute. However, if you're, just, uh, if you're not executing a native SQL query, even if you're using JPA and Hibernate, you are going to lose a lot. And in a way, you have to understand that Hibernate was never a replacement to SQL. No, it was a replacement to the JDBC API. So in order to you know, use the JDBC API, uh, it provides you a much uh, better alternative to that. Another, another thing that you have, even in SQL 92, is derived tables. Do you, have you ever heard of derived tables? It's, you, know, you, have, you can select, and then you have like an inline view. You can select from that. Actually, the way that this works is you, when you see that, this is like streaming, because the output from the inner query becomes the input to the outer query. So this is just like stream processing. Why do you want to do that? Because, for instance, you want to order by first, and only then, uh, truncate the result and limiting the result. If you don't do that, this is Oracle, if you don't do that and you rewrite it as a single query, it will not work because window functions are executing first and then comes order by. So you need that, this derived table. This is for the next 10 in Oracle. So now you have three 
levels. So you have three queries that are in line. So yes, even SQL 92, even if it's, if it's very old, it still offers many, uh, many solutions to many problems that we have uh, on a daily basis. Next. OK. However, SQL 92 was good, but at the, at the time, those was, were the gadgets of the time. Just like these gadgets were, were, were great, were very, very good, were very good products. However, I don't use them anymore. And just like why I don't use them anymore, because they are better uh, pr uh, products now, they are, they are better technologies. In the same way that we have better gadgets, also SQL has better features, and it, uh, it improved a lot in this time. So I'm not really using those, and also I'm, I'm not, nowadays I'm not really limiting myself to only SQL 92. So I'm still using features, and I'm features from newer versions of SQL. And I'm going to show you what, what are some of those features. So Previously, if you limit yourself to SQL, this is what you're using from the standard. This, these were the first increments. However, this is what we have now. So there were many increments throughout the time, from 99 to 2016. So, for instance, in, uh, in 99, besides Boolean and other things, one thing that was really interesting that was added was support for common table expressions, like with queries, and also recursive common table expressions, which allow you to uh, go and go throughout an hierarchical structure and uh, building your result set in such a way that you go from one level to the other. For instance, what's the problem with derived tables? You can do the same. For instance, if you have, we, we had this query before. It was for pagination. It is a derived, uh, a derived table. The more, uh, the more queries I need to add in my derived table, the more they are nasty and they are difficult to read. So in a way, I want to have a much better way to read, not to read from the innermost to the outermost query, but to read from top to bottom, because that's the easiest way, uh, that's the easiest way we're, um, and we're doing this when we're reading code. When, whenever you're reading a procedural or imperative code, you're reading from top to bottom to understand it. So yes, you can rewrite this also using, uh, uh, using common table expressions. And the best thing about it is that it's, this feature is widely supported. So you have it in Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB. These are, let, let's say, the top, uh, the top four and five databases uh, that are used. And most of the time, they are also associated uh, with Java. If you're using Java, most of the, it's very likely that you're using one of those. So the same query can be rewritten like this one. So we have the first, the innermost, innermost query, we define it, and then the outermost query becomes this, like this is the middle. Now this one selects from the previous, which we have uh, described before, and then we have the final query selecting from uh, this one. So it's much easier to write and uh, to reason about what happens. So now there is a catch about that. There were some databases where, if you uh, rewrote a derived table using a common table uh, expression, like for instance Postgres SQL previously, um, the end result, although you uh, although you'd get the same result, it would not be uh, it would not be so efficient because the database could not inline and rewrite the query as if you would write it using a derived table. So you have to pay attention to the execution plan when you're doing that. So yes, getting better readability is OK, but it's not OK to pay the price in performance. Some databases don't have any problem with that, but you have to keep uh, that in mind. Now, another great example which we can actually benefit from recursive common table expression is, for instance, whenever we want to, we, we want to show the topmost comments in a site like, for instance, Reddit. Have, do, you, do you know Reddit? Do you read Reddit? Yeah, some, some of you do, some don't. Reddit is full of drama, so if you want more drama in your life, you can go to Reddit. There's, uh, very, there are a lot of uh, uh, topics, debates going on there, and because of that, there, there are topics which go viral and have many, many comments thousands of comments, or maybe uh, tens of thousands of comments. So you don't want to display all of them. You want to display the first top n, which, but ba how? Based on their total score. Because every comment has a given score. You can upvote or you can downvote. So people decide what comments are more interesting. So you want to show, at first, the ones which are the best 
like, uh, the most interesting because and hide the other ones or uh, just allow them to go using infinity scro infinite scroll if they want toward the last one, which maybe they are not uh, so relevant. So how are you going to actually build a system like that? So you can have a post table and then you can have a post comment. Now, the post comment has a parent ID. Uh, it has a parent ID column here, which has a foreign key back to the ID. So you can have one comment replying to a, uh, to a given comment. So you can build, using this table, using a, a, a relational model, you can build uh, or emulate a structure, a tree-based structure, an hierarchy. So you can navigate and you know from these routes, we have the le first level, we have the second and third level, and so and so and so. So now, we also want, this is our requirement, we want to get the top three commons along with all their hierarchy, but we want to get based on their total scores. So we need to go across the entire hierarchy, calculate uh, the total cost, order them, and only uh, display the first three. So if these are the commons that I have, for instance, these are the costs, so if I go, this is the total score for each uh, particular hierarchy that we have. So now how, how we can implement, let's say that we have this uh, task there, so we have to implement it. So there are many options to do it. One option, for instance, is to just fetch all the data, all the comments associated to that particular post, and then we can just do the aggregation in Java. It's, it's as simple as that. We can just use streams, it's now with Java 8, it's even more, much more compact to write something like that. And most of the time, you, you will probably favor to implement a solution in the language which you like the most. So for instance, people like to associate and like to say, I'm a Java developer. So when you say that you're a Java developer, most likely that you want to solve every problem using Java, even if you don't have to. So for instance, if you have a, a CSS or HTML problem, you're going to solve it with Java. How? Using Apache Wicket or something like that. So you try to hide everything. So, or for instance, if you want to write a query, I'm not going to write a query. I'm going to write an entity query because I want to be isolated from the fact that I'm uh, executing a query against the database. So let's admit it. For many people, this is their first option because it's very easy to implement. You can test it. You can get results. And as you will see, it's not necessarily a bad, uh, a bad idea. However, you can also do it in the database. How? The first level is very easy to get because it's the level where the parent ID is null because those are the roots. You haven't commented anything. So it's OK. So the first level is not very difficult to, to get. Now, also, the second level is also not difficult to get because starting from the roots, we can just go and inner join based on the parent ID, and we can locate the second level. So the first two levels are fine. However, how? What, what if we have four, three, five, 100 levels? You, uh, you would have to know up front how many levels you have in order to write such a query. So this is not feasible. You cannot do it dynamically. And you don't have to do it, actually, because now you have support. You have with recursive for that. So how? You, in with recursive, it's just you start, uh, at first you define the virtual table that you want to construct. Actually, it's called the recursive. This is a bad term. It's not recursive. Actually, you build it iteratively. This is no recursion, but unfortunately, uh, the SQL standard committee cho chose this term. But in reality, whenever you see it, you have, to, uh, you, you have to remember that you are actually building it iteratively. So this is basically what we want to do. In the post comment table, we didn't have the root ID column. Yeah, we could add it, but then that would not be normalized. So we want actually to introduce a root ID table so that we know what are all the commons to what hierarchy they belong. So that's exactly what you want to do. So the first query in the with recursive is called an anchor member, and it's the query which selects the first level. In our case, the first level is the commons which don't have, uh, they don't have any parent ID. Now, the second, we have also the second member. It's called the recursive member, and it's building the levels from the second to the nth to, to, to the last one. How? Because we're inner joining this table, which are binding iteratively, with, uh, with, the one, with, with, with the one we are extracting data from based on the parent ID. And that's, that's how 
you are building level by level, and at, and at the end, we're just projecting whatever we want from that inline view that we build uh, iteratively. So basically, this is the query that we have. At first, we have the roots, and we're, build, and we're adding the first, the roots. Then we have the second level, which the parent ID point to the previous roots. So we're adding those as well. Notice here how we're building also the root ID. And then we have, for the third level, we're also adding that. Perfectly. Now we have this root ID. That's exactly what we are lacking. So now we have a table, a virtual table, which contains that root ID. But why do we, why do we need that? Because based on that root ID, we can, using window function, calculating the total score across the entire uh, table that we built previously. So now window functions have been added in SQL 2003, and they are being, they've been, they are now supported by the top databases from Oracle 8. Nowadays, even in MySQL, uh, you have these window functions. So what do they give you? They give you the ability to actually aggregate data without destroying the result set. Because if you're using group by, group by actually works like a reduce on stream. So you have the stream of data, and you're reducing it to one row per bucket. So you have multiple groups, but we don't want that. If we do that, we're destroying our result set. So we don't want to aggregate and uh, reduce our entire. We want to keep the table and adding a new column. So you can do that using window functions. So actually, we want to uh, add up all the scores per partition. So we partition per root ID. We partition the entire result set based on the root ID that we previously calculated. And now we calculate the total, total score. And what we will get? a new virtual table. So how does it work? So for instance, if this is the previous table that we built iteratively, now we can simply add the total score. For this, for the next root ID, and we just collect and calculate for every level. So now we have a new table where we also have the total score, because that was important, because we want now to order based on the total score. So how can you do that? You need a new window function. With, with using this with queries, you can see that they just work like streams. So the output of one stream becomes the input to the another one. It's just like when you're using a batch on Linux, something like that. So now we're building a new table where we're just going to add the ranking. So we know which are the top, uh, the top hierarchies based on their scores. For that, we can use dense rank, and we order by the total score. And again, this is a window function, because we don't want to reduce the result set. So if this is the top score, it gets the ranking number of 1. Now, for the next one, we go from, uh, for all of them, and the database is going to calculate and assign the rankings. So now we have a table, which also contains the scores. So having the scores, we can now pick up and choose the top N that we're interested in. For us, in our, in our case, we wanted to get the top three po post-common hierarchies, and then we're just going to limit and order by the result set. So if this was the previous table, now we get exactly what we got previously using Java 8 streams. Now, among all these, we have two alternatives now. Which one do you think is better? You know what's the best answer to, every, to any question? It depends. It, all, it, all, it always depends. So in this case, it's the same. It depends on the data, how much data you have. If you don't have a lot of data, it's much easier to fetch it and aggregate it in memory in the application, because aggregating in Java is very fast. Operations in Java happens very fast. But the more data you have, Fetching data, a lot of data, is not going to scale because you are going to saturate the resources, either the I.O. bandwidth on the database or the network or probably in your application, the memory, so it doesn't really scale. So then processing uh, in, the, in, in the database actually is going to render a much better result. So in this case, if you know about these features, if you know about recursive queries, if you know about window functions, then you have a new option whenever you are facing uh, a problem that's data intensive. Without knowing about this, 
you are most likely going to uh, implement almost everything in the application, fetch data, and then process it in the application layer. OK, so now that was in SQL 2003. We got window functions. And another cool feature that, we, uh, that was introduced there is merge. Why is it, uh, why is it important? Is, uh, first, it allows you to, uh, you, you can get an upsert. Now, merge, as it was defined in the standard, it's being supported by Oracle and SQL Server. In other databases like Postgres and MySQL, you have a specific way of uh, actually expressing an upsert. So in a way, what, what exactly is an upsert? Upsert is that um, statement which allows you to insert something only if you don't find already a record there. And you can also choose that if you find a record there, then do the update. How many times you had this feature where you wanted to do, to do an insert, but if there was uh, a record there, then update it. Now, you have multiple connections. Things happen concurrently in the database. How people usually do it? They do a select. If, if they don't find anything, then they decide whether the outcome should be insert or update. But however, whenever you do stuff like that, it doesn't really work. You're just lowering the probability of having a constraint violation. You don't eliminate it. Especially, you don't eliminate it whenever you're using the read committed isolation level. So that doesn't really work. It just, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to replicate the problem. But eventually, if you, let it, if you let it in production, you'll bump into that issue. So it's better if you're just expressing it uh, in a way that relies on the database uh, concurrency level in order uh, to give you this uh, and to avoid this, con uh, this constraint violation. So for instance, using merge, you can choose here to execute the insert. But if during the insert, the database finds that you already have a record using that particular ID, then you, just you are going to ignore. Nothing will happen, and you're not going to throw an exception. The problem with throwing an exception is once you are throwing an exception, then that current transaction is going to roll back. You're going to lose everything that you had before. So the user will have to retry. So you don't really want to, to throw and to roll back exceptions uh, um, heavily or multiple times for the user, because the user is going to be annoyed. Now, another option where you can use the merge, for instance, you can actually try to do the insert. But if you find a record there, then do the update. So this works, and it's going to be atomically. It works, and the database will ensure uh, that uh, those operations are going to happen atomically. So yes, this is much better to use. So even if you're, even if you're not using Oracle or SQL Server, you have uh, options how to do it also in PostgreSQL or MySQL. It's just that it's a non-standard uh, approach. SQL, then you have SQL 2006, which was just a minor increment to 2003, just that it, uh, it extended the support for XML. Nowadays, this is not very typical, and also it's not uh, widely supported. However, SQL 2008 was again a major uh, increment of the standard, and it added support among many features, like for instance, instead of triggers. That, that's very interesting, because you can use those to have views where you have partition data, you can write to the current view, which redirects towards uh, different partitions. Or you can use it for uh, soft deletes as well to hide records that, uh, that got deleted, and so and so. Uh, and also, one, one thing which is really, really useful is that from 2008 onwards, now we have a standard way of actually implementing pagination. Because previously, every database implemented in a different way. You, you saw how, how that uh, is, uh, was uh, implemented in Oracle for the derived table. For instance, in SQL Server, you used to have top. In Postgres and MySQL, you had offset and limit. Nowadays, you have a standard way. So if this was the previous Oracle way of doing pagination, of getting you the top n records, where you're, you, you used to, uh, you had the derived table. Nowadays, instead of writing this, you're writing it like that, which is much more compact, much easier to read than before. Or for the next n records, where you used to have three selects, which were wrapping the result set and keep on pushing to the other stream on and on, instead of writing that, you only have to write this. So this is w uh, much easier, much more compact, much easier to, to reason about it uh, than, than before. And what's nice about it is that this is the standard, so it works 
the same, in the same way it works in Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres SQL. MySQL, for instance, does, at, 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 the, when I'm, at the moment when I'm giving this presentation, it, doesn't, uh, it hasn't implemented this feature. Now, we had the standard 2011, which arrived, and actually it introduced a very cool feature, is system version, uh, system version tables and temporal tables, temporal databases. Unfortunately, this feature is only implemented by SQL Server and MariaDB. It's a very useful one, and hopefully it will, is going to be implemented by more and more databases. Basically, it allows you to, to view the state of a table in time, so you can define on a row level from what time to what time a given uh, record value was valid. Like, for instance, you can have contracts, well, if you're building financial or insurance application, where you can define that this contract, uh, these terms of contract started on this date and ended on that date, and then you had negotiated and have another contract, so you want to build like a report spanning over a large period of time, and you want to calculate how much money uh, th those contracts generated. So using temporal table, actually, it's very easy because this is embedded in the database. You don't have to, you don't have to try to emulate it. However, this is not widely supported, so uh, that's why uh, we're going to skip to 2016. And in 2016, one great feature that was implemented was JSON support. Now, previously, we used to build an application where you also had the requirement of storing something in JSON. It was some data that came. It was uh, unstructured data. We needed to store it because whenever we had some problem, uh, when we process that data, we want to go and to show to the client that, yeah, this is what you sent us. That's why this price probably uh, is holding, doesn't reflect the latest state because you didn't uh, send us uh, uh, the proper price value for that. So because we, we PostgreSQL at that time didn't have this uh, feature, we had to also add an OSQL database. It was a MongoDB at the time. However, the more technologies you add, the more complicated it gets. You know, it's very easy. Nowadays, I see those uh, diagrams at conferences with microservices, you can choose whatever database you want, but this is not feasible. I mean, yeah, it's very easy to put it on a diagram to, and tell you, just use whatever database you, you want. You can have 10 database uh, technologies if you want. Yes, for a developer, it's easy. But then, from an operational perspective, it's a nightmare. Because for every database, you have to have monitoring, replication, backups. You have to have a DBA that knows which kernel version of Linux works with that date, uh, database engine. There are many things which complicate operations, not to mention that people come and go from projects. You have to hire new people. They have to uh, get a custom, not with one, but with 10 databases now. So this is not feasible. So if you can just use one, like for instance, most of the time you're probably going to use a relational database. So if you have the requirement of just using JSON, it doesn't make sense just to add a NoSQL database just for that. You have it, and it's, you can just use and map it uh, using a, on a table. And what's nice about it is that this is supported by the top four databases. All of them have this uh, functionality now. For instance, I'm going to show you this is in MySQL. You can define this properties column which is of the type JSON now. So basically, we can now store relational data and also non-relational data. Nowadays, people call it relational database systems. Yeah, they are not. Now, nowadays, they are SQL databases because they have relational structures and non-relational, like XML or, or for instance, uh, JSON. So what you can do with that? Not only that, you can store data in JSON format, and you can get it back. So besides simple CRUDs, now I also have functionality. So for instance, you can go inside the structure, and you can go, give me the price from that JSON, where the title inside that JSON object is this one. So you can go inside the structure and read scalar values. Not only that, you can do that. You can even index those as well. So it gives you, uh, it's quite flexible in this way. Or, for instance, you can also get Yes, in this case, if this was the object that we had in the database, we just go, we locate this one, and we're going to read the price. Or you can also get an object inside this properties JSON object, we still have some scalar values and also an array of reviews. So we can just go and read, give me the uh, reviews from those properties, and then I can render those. So for instance, if these are the reviews, I can go with this query and I can fetch 
all those reviews from the database. So we, I go inside the structure, and I can build whatever result set I want. But yes, this is fine. But actually, the best feature that it has is actually this one here. I can go from this JSON, and actually, I can transform it to a relational, to a relational table, to a table. Why it's so important? Because once I do that, I can aggregate it. I can join it with existing tables. So I have all the full power that SQL offers me. Now I can take advantage of it and actually aggregate data that was in JSON and combine it with data, which is now stored in the classic relational tables. Think about it, how you do that if you had your JSON in MongoDB and you want to aggregate with the other data. So probably you have to expose it to a different system and do the, aggregate out, uh, the aggregation outside of those two relational databases. So nowadays you don't have to do that. If you're using database and all of them support that a feature, actually this is a standard. So based on these reviews, I can actually build a virtual table that for the first review there, I get a first row then I get a second row, and I get a third row. So I can just go that, aggregate, calculate the ratings, uh, join with some other tables. So this is a very, very cool feature that you got. So yes, there are many, many. Uh, it's impossible to cover all of them in this uh, presentation. Actually, this have, uh, I usually cover them, uh, all of them, in two days of training. However, it's important to realize that there are many, many features, and it's actually worth to just spend a little bit of time to read the database documentation to see what you, uh, uh, what you have there, because there might be features that, will, uh, that can help you address many, uh, many issues that you had before, and you had to work around them and uh, add some sort of uh, uh, very inefficient hacks in order to solve some problems. So that was 2016. However, nowadays, this is not where SQL ends. Nowadays, we have new SQL databases. So it was like that. We used to have relational databases. Then we had that trend with no SQL databases. And afterwards, a new, uh, a new type of databases have emerged. And they are called new SQL. And now, not only that they embrace the language, the SQL language, but also they offer they usually offer a much stricter consistency guarantee. Like, for instance, they try to favor serializability over uh, weaker isolation level like read committed or repeatable read. So for instance, new, what, what new SQL database? Like for instance, have you ever heard of CockroachDB? This is a new uh, globally distributed database. Now this is still being built. Actually, yeah, it works, but it's quite slow. However, what's interesting about it is that the syntax, if you take a look, is just uh, standard SQL. So if you invest the time to learn SQL, you can actually use it with relational and also with this new type of database systems. Or VolDB. This one is actually built by, uh, it was built by Michael Stonebreaker, the same guy I showed you before in the beginning, who was the responsible for Ingress, for Postgres and Postgres SQL. Now he also uh, built this one, VolDB. It's an in-memory database. It's very, very useful for online gaming. Why for online gaming? Because being in memory is very fast. And when you're building an online game uh, globally distributed, like uh, StarCraft or WarCraft, you don't want to use a relational database and wait for two minutes for your action to, to have. So you're going to go to a battle, and then you have eventual consistency. So either you, m m maybe you won, but then after two minutes, you realize that you, you didn't won. Actually, you died. So yeah, that's, uh, that would not work very well with an online game. So yes, you have this. Uh, new in-memory databases using now SQL. So why did they use SQL? Because it's a standard. Also, it's declarative. It's very easy to, to express whatever you want. You don't have to write the algorithm up front. The database will figure it out for you. And yes, it scales very well. Now, also, BigQuery, uh, this one is provided as a service by Google. It's also used internally uh, by them. And they realized that it's very useful also to express it and to have an engine which accept standard SQL and uh, then render the results. And actually, you can use that to go and aggregate billions of rows and large volume petabytes of data in a very, very uh, short amount of time using just simple SQL and uh, BigQuery. Or another database from Google, which is Google Spanner. I'm not sure. Have you ever heard of it? It's an 
yeah, someone heard of it. It's a new globally distributed database. Now, why, why in the world did Google actually uh, came up to write their own database? You know, at first, when they were crawling data from, uh, from all over the world, they used to have the largest batch processing technology in the world, big table. They patented now. That one was, uh, they released a paper, and then people then implemented it as Apache Hadoop. So they had this massive batch processor job, which was very, very useful for processing large volumes of data. However, you could not use it uh, for th uh, things like Google Analytics and for AdWords, which is how Google makes money. Because in AdWords, you need a database that gives you instant results and of the data. So if you make a modification, you get instant feedback, and you know if that was applied or not, because you have to make bidding on ads. So you cannot just wait for half an hour to know if you need to display an ad or not. So you needed this technology, because it's very important to, to how uh, Google does business. So yeah, they built a globally distributed database. And what's interesting about it is that they decided to offer SQL support for it. Why? Because people are used, the Google developers, just like any other developers, you know, they are human beings, like you or not. They have the same, uh, they, it's much easier for them to process stuff using SQL instead of always trying to express it using a new algorithm. So basically, not only that you have SQL now for relational databases, you have it even for uh, new SQL databases as well. So investing the time to understand how it works and how to express what you want to fetch from the database is important because as th these databases are new, it's very likely that they are, being, uh, they, they are going to be used even five, 10, or maybe many years from now on. So with that being told, thank you very much for coming. Now, if you have questions, I think we have plenty of time to, to answer them. Don't be shy. Yes? I think we need a microphone. Yes, please. Yeah, raise your hand uh, more vir virtuously. Yeah, like that, two hands is way better. Hello, so we are using JSON in relational databases, and uh, I have one question. From a modeling perspective, would you recommend creating multiple JSON columns in a table, or just a single table where, you where all the, yeah. uh, let's say, the columns are segregated by keys into a single JSON uh, column, right? Because mm -hmm. with the relational, let's say, old relational databases, you're, you're constrained by the types of, uh, of the columns, right? Like int, the varchar, mm -hmm. whatever. But with JSON, you can, you can put do whatever, whatever you want. right? Yeah. So yeah. you can create multiple columns or a single column. So are you aware of any constraints regarding this? Well, that's a very good question. I'm going to, uh, to quote Oscar Wilde, who said, uh, you know, in life you should use moderation, everything in moderation, even moderation. So, yes, when you think about JSON, if you're using a relational database, you should strive, most of the time you should strive to use a relational model and benefit from the uh, type save, the fact that your column only accepts one. So if you can actually uh, extract that data, if they always have, because most of the time they don't vary that much. They have, even JSON has a structure. Maybe something uh, from time to time is missing from there, but if you can transform it, at least that was our case. We used to have announcement of properties that we were a real estate system uh, agency. So we got that, but we wanted to transform that to a canonical model. So only for things like, for instance, storing uh, the, the initial objects we put it uh, in JSON or for stuff that bypass some processing. So in your case, I would try to do as much as possible, transform it and put in relational database. So if you have many of them, you should question why do you have so many of them? Because you're still using a relational database. Yes, it's very easy, but as you will see, what, what database you are using? What, which you? Oracle? Oh, you're using all of them. So yes, so now, there are data, like for instance in Postgres, you have gene indexes, inverted indexes, so you can go index the entire JSON. So yes, it's going to be efficient to go inside. 
But for instance, SQL Server doesn't have that. You have to have a different column. You have to write a compound column. The more you have, the more so it gets uglier and uglier. So yes, you have this feature, but you have to use it with moderation because yes, for some specific uh, features, it's good to have it. But then if every, I, I would not overdo it because it, you lose actually all the feature that I showed you already. Because if all your data is ingested, yes, you can extract it, you can transform it to SQL, but better transform it up front and have it in dedicated tables if you can. So even if you're thinking of one advantage is that the structure is dynamic, so it's very good for migrations, but you can still achieve the same like Nicola uh, showed you also previously. You can still do it uh, if that's your goal. So I would not do it. I I'll probably not store many, many columns with that. Probably just one if it's absolutely necessary for that. Too much SQL, right? <laughs> Do you have any other question? Otherwise, thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, you can find me in the hallways as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>